So the first part, um, and Dan quotes this so many times, Proverbs 25, 2, this is one of his favorite verses. It's the glory of Yah to conceal a thing, but the honor of kings to search out a matter. And just as I said, the creation week, the seven days of creation, reveal Yah Yahweh's plan, his 7,000 year plan of redemption. And we're going to see that as we go in this. Okay, now you can see that there is in the first sentence of Genesis, where, before we get into the seven days of creation, um, we've gone over this before, this part of it in Torah study, but I'll go over this again. There are seven uh, um, Hebrew words that com comprise the first sentence of Genesis. Breshi bara Elohim et Hashemayim vet haaretz. And within the word Breshit, we find the full plan of salvation. Um, here we go. In the beginning created Yah, the heavens and the earth. But we see the entire plan of salvation here. Um, and um, we're going to look at the first word Breshit. And then we're going to look at the seven words because the seven words reveal. Let me put one more thing on here. Uh, if you look at the menorah here, you see that there's seven branches of the menorah. The mid branch called the Shamash is the, uh, the, servant the, the servant branch, and it represents uh, Yahusha, Yeshua. And so what do we find, though, if we look at each one of these words, the seven words of the, in, in, in uh, the Hebrew, the fourth word is the Aleph Tav. We know the Aleph Tav um, in, in Revelation, we've always been taught the Alpha and the Omega, where Jesus says, I am the Alpha and the Omega. We know what he really said is I am the Aleph and the Tav. So if you take each word to represent a thousand years and you go over to the fourth word, that would be the 4,000th year. When did he show up to this creation? And it's the end of the 4,000th year that our Messiah appeared on the, on the scene. And we see if you go to the sixth word, we see again that he's coming back. But this time he's connected with the Vav there. And what do we, wh why? Why would he be connected with the Vav? There you go, Bray Sheet. I wanted to point to that because we're going to find the entire plan of salvation encoded in the word bray sheet. There's created, yah, and there's your Aleph Tav, and there's the heavens, Hashemayim. There's your um, sixth day, which is where we are. We're at the end of the sixth day. We're about to go into um, the seventh day, which is the millennial kingdom. Okay, so there we go. Yeshua said, uh, he said three times in Revelation, I am the Aleph and the Tab, the first, the last, the beginning, and the end. Blessed are those who do his commandments that they may have the right to the tree of life. So we see here he's, he's letting us know how we're going to get back. Our journey is a journey back to the tree of life. How do we get there? Do his commandments. So we do have to do something. Okay. Um, and here it is again. In the beginning, created Yah, Aleph Tab, that's the untranslated the heavens and the earth. <laughs> okay. Now, as I said there, on the sixth day, when he shows up, he's uh, connected to the Bob. And how do we know this is future? Because Zechariah 12, 10 says, and I will pour out upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and supplications, and they shall look on him whom they have pierced. That's the Bob, the nail. And they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. We know this has not happened. When he returns, the house of Yehuda, Judah, who has not accepted the Messiah will, uh, those who are left. And we know that only a third of them are going to come through, which is what the prophecies tell us. Most of them are going to die. But those who are left are going to mourn. For those, they shall look on him whom they have pierced. 
they will realize. So he shows up with the nail in his side on the sixth day. All right, now here we go again. Um, Bereshit, bara, Elohim, et hashamayim, vet haaretz. We're gonna look at the word Bereshit. And Bereshit is the first word. We know that in a Torah scroll, the first letter <coughs> is enlarged. It's a picture, it means a house, it's um, bait. And the reason that we're told it's enlarged from those who have studied it from for thousands of years is that this is the story of Yah taking a bride and um, building his house. And so what we find in the first word brace sheet is the entire plan of salvation. It's encoded. Okay, there we go. Brace sheet underlined. Here's our first word. I know Stephen would know what this means, but this is bar. Um, you see your first two letters. Bar means son. Okay. Our next letter we're going to look at, Aleph. Aleph. Yeah, Ara Aramaic. <laughs> yeah, that's in Aramaic. Yeah. And Ben also means son. But bar means son, and it also means grain. Correct? Um, okay. Aleph. Right. Means God. He was the grain of wheat that went into the ground. And um, okay, here's the next one. Sheet. Sheet means thorn. You've got your sheen, your um, your vav, and your that's a yod. That's a yod. I'm sorry. Um, the vav is longer. That's the yod and the tav. Okay, and your next one is Rosh, which means head. Okay, Brosh, which means tree. This one is Shy, which means gift. And this is the T, the Tav, which represents the covenant. So you've got the words sun, God, thorns, head, tree, gift, covenant. How can we put that all together? The son of God, crowned with thorns upon his head on a tree, is the gift of the covenant. And so what we can say is that he was truly slain from the foundation of the world. Revelations 13, 8, all the inhabitants of the earth will worship the beast, all whose names have not been written in the Lamb's book of life, the Lamb who was slain from the creation of the world. So our creator has a seven day, 7,000 year plan for this earth. And we're gonna look into the hidden prophecies of creation, the 7,000 year plan of our creator. In order to do that, we have to unlock the prophecy that's hidden in every day of creation. I found this um, just this week, and I had actually seen this before, but I put it into this PowerPoint. And this is from the book of Enoch which Enoch says at the beginning, it was the book written for those of the last days. That's us. And he talks about the, um, the different weeks, which is the different epochs of time. Um, and he says afterwards in the seventh week, um, Dr. Pigeon says that seventh week represents the years 264 to 964 AD. It says a perverse generation shall arise. That was the time of the rising of the Catholic church. Um, abundant shall be its deeds and all its deeds perverse. During its completion, which we know it's still going, the righteous shall be selected from the everlasting plant of righteousness, that would be our Messiah, and to them shall be given the sevenfold doctrine of his whole creation. Wow. So we find that this book that was in the canon, I think, um, just before 19, uh, 1850, um, our ancestors actually read these books. It says that the final generation would be given the sevenfold doctrine of his creation. Well, we're going to look at what I believe that is. What is the sevenfold doctrine? And that is that every day of creation represents a thousand years. And what happened on that day is so prophetic. And that's what we're going to look at. Remember, and we, we know this because 
the scripture tells us, Isaiah 46, 9 and 10. Remember the former things of old, for I am Yah, and there is no other. I am Yahweh, there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning. Wow. From ancient times that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. Here's another translation. I make known the end from the beginning, from ancient times, what is still to come. I say my purpose will stand and I will do all that I please. So this makes us laugh at all the different, back in the 70s, the different books that we read and we thought that we understood about the end times. Now we're beginning to understand if you really want to know what's coming in the end, you got to know the Torah. You got to go back to the beginning. Okay. Now, there are several different of the church fathers that speak about this very thing. One of them is found in the epistle of Barnabas. I'm not endorsing that epistle. I, I haven't even read through the entire epistle, so I can't say I agree with everything in it. But he speaks of the Sabbath at the beginning of creation. And he says, and Yah made in six days the work of his hands. And on the seventh day, he made an end and he rested on the seventh day and he sanctified it. Con consider my children what this signifies, that he made an end in six days. The meaning of it is this, that in 6,000 years, the creator will bring all things to an end. For with him, one day is as a thousand years. He himself testifies saying, behold, the day of Yah shall be as a thousand years. Therefore, children, in six days, that is in 6,000 years, all things shall be accomplished. And he rested on the seventh day. He means this, that when his son shall come, he will destroy the season of the wicked one. And I think that's upon us and will judge the godless and change the sun and the moon and the stars. And he will truly rest on the seventh day. Here's another one, Hippolytus. He also taught that Yah has a 6,000 to 7,000 year plan. And this is what he said, and 6,000 years must needs be accomplished in order that the Sabbath may come, the rest, the holy day on which Yah rested from all his works. For the Sabbath is the type and emblem of the future kingdom of the saints when they shall reign with Christ when he comes from heaven, as John says in his apocalypse, for a day with Yahweh is as a thousand years. Since then, in six days, Yah made all things. It follows that 6,000 years must be fulfilled. Arrhenius, here's, here's the last one. Trained by Polycarp, remember who taught Polycarp was John the Immerser, Yochanan the Immerser, who wrote the book of Revelation. He said in 150 AD, for in as many days as this world was made, in so many thousands years, it shall be concluded. This is an account of the things formerly created, and also it is a prophecy of what is to come. For the day of Yah is as a thousand years, and in six days created things were completed. It is evident, therefore, that they will come to an end at the 6,000th year. And he wrote this in a book. Not to say I agree with everything found in that book. I don't know. So while the day is as a thousand years and the end is revealed from the beginning, principles were well understood so many years ago. Many still miss that Peter was revealing more than that. Peter applied Yahweh's purpose for man was to be revealed in creation, not just the end. Peter showed how in the second day of creation in which the water and the earth, he called this the second day of creation in which the water and the earth separated was related to Noah and the flood. Hmm. That just happened to happen at the same time frame of the 2000th year time frame. Using that principle by Peter, we should be able to find significant prophetic events in creation for every day or every thousand years for men. So let's begin. Okay, here's architecture. Our Yahweh is the ultimate architect of order and design. He is not a God of confusion, but of peace. You will see his uncanny design and connection between the seven days of the biblical creation account and a biblical plan for a 7,000 year design for humanity. <laughs> and this is with the verse we already said, declaring the end from the beginning, from ancient times, the things that are not yet done. The creation account is not only literal, it is also prophetic. Okay, so you must first understand this biblical principle. A single day can be used to describe a 24-hour period 
or a thousand year period. Okay, because Psalm 94 says, for a thousand years in thy sight are but as yesterday when it is past and as a watch in the night. And then 2 Peter 3, 8 concurs with that. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with Yahweh as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. So why? Sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. That's yeah. why when Yahweh said, um, in the day that you eat of that fruit, you will surely die. I don't know if you get into that. Adam, Adam, <laughs> Adam died at 930 years. Yeah, we're, we're going to talk about that. He died within that first day. Okay. A day is as a thousand years, scriptural support. Okay. But of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Well, either God lied or this day is referencing that thousand year period. Adam lived 930 years. So if, if it's a thousand years, he died in that day. Okay. Remember Peter, when he gave his famous sermon on Shavuot, Pentecost, he said, and it shall come to pass in the last day, saith Yahweh, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Well, Peter describes them as living in the last days. Hmm. That was 2000 years ago or from Yahweh's perspective, two days ago that started at the beginning of the fifth day. So the fifth and the sixth days are the last days. We've been living in the last days for the past 2,000 years. Okay, Hebrews 1, 1 and 2. And in the past, Yah spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, whoa, he calls it these last days. He has spoken to us by his son. Even the days of Jesus were known as the last days because even though he was born at the end of the fourth day, he lived into the fifth day. So the fifth and the sixth days are the last days. Okay. Now I want to go over this. Genesis 6, 3. This is um, part of our Torah portion for today, I believe, or it starts next week, but I'm going to go over it anyway. Then Yahweh said, my spirit will not contend with humans forever for they are mortal. And their days will be 120 years. What did he mean? Well, those who've studied this believe that he's speaking of jubilee years. 120 jubilee years equals 6,000 years that is appointed for man to reign on the earth on their terms. There's a distinct correlation between six days of creation and 6,000 years of recorded biblical history, followed by rest on the seventh day. Here we go. Each one of these days, you're going to see exactly what is in this. I'm not going to, I'm, I'm going to take them one at a time, but it's fascinating to find out what happened in the thousand year period of that day of creation. And that's what we're going to look at. Okay. Here's day one. And Yah saw that the light was good and Yah separated the light from the darkness and he called the light day and the darkness he called night. And there was evening and there was morning one day. Genesis 1, 4 to 5. Okay, it says, Yah separated the light from the darkness. Well, how did this happen? How long was Adam in, and Eve in the garden? They were in the garden in the book of Jubilees. It tells us exactly seven years, two months, and 17 days. It was the same day the flood started, <laughs> which is amazing. Um. Yah warns Adam regarding the tree of the knowledge of good and evil that he will die the day he eats it. Mm. Well, he did. He Remember, he ate it because of his wife that he loved. Although spiritual death entered Adam on that day of sin, his physical death occurred 900 years, 930 years later, still within that thousand year day. This is discussed in the apocryphal book of Jubilees. Okay. And then you see that there's a separation just as you have light and you have darkness. Once Adam ate of that tree of the knowledge of good and evil, darkness entered into his soul. Now he has light and darkness. He's a mixture and because he ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And so this is the same thing, the separating the light 
from the darkness. This is the prophecy of the first thousand years. And so what do we see? Righteousness and lawlessness. We have both now. We are people that are filled with both, unfortunately. And um, the separation of good from evil, lawless from righteous, obedience from disobedience was the fulfillment of day one of creation. And they were thrown out of the garden because of what they did. On day one of creation, light and darkness were separated. This is the hidden prophecy in day one because of the fall. Light and darkness metaphorically represent good and evil, righteousness, and lawlessness. So the first thousand years, day one reveals they ate of the tree of good and evil, introducing sin or darkness into man. From that day forward, we have both good and evil, righteousness, lawless, and they've existed in us, separating the light from the darkness. There's a separation of good and evil in man. That was the fulfillment of day one of creation. Out of the darkness, Elohim creates the light. And in the first millennial day, Adam, who was created as a being of light, fell into the darkness of sin. The evening and the morning, the first part of the millennial day is represented by darkness. So man goes from light to darkness. Sin through Adam came at the beginning. It's represented by darkness. And, and about halfway through that day, Enoch was born. And remember it said Enoch walked with Yah and he represented those who reflect Yah's light. And he was translated in the end. He was born 622 years after creation and he lightened the rest of the millennium with truth. Adam was told in the day you eat of it, you will die. And this was fulfilled. <clears throat> okay, God, Yah separated the light from the darkness. It was evening and morning, the first day. Okay, so he divided the light from the darkness. That's the prophetic verse, the fulfillment. Behold, man has become like one of us, <clears throat> knowing good and evil. Light and dark, good and evil. All this happened on day one, that thousand years. Okay, day two. Now. Does anybody know there's one of the days of these seven days of creation that Yahweh did not call good? Do you know what day that was? It's the second day. Dan just said it's the second day. Why? Because that's when the flood happened. And Yah said, let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters and let it separate the water from the waters. Okay. So we see here almost in the middle of this time, you see the, the birth of Adam in the in this PowerPoint um, picture here, all the way up to the flood, Noah, about halfway through that second thousand years is when the flood started. And that's very, very interesting. In the middle, everything broke loose. And that's what's prophesied here. What are the prophetic words from the scripture revealing what would happen? Well, it says, let there be a firmament, a sky in the midst of the waters. This was the first time the sky was full of water during the flood that covered the earth. The fulfillment is Genesis 7, 11, The flood gates of the sky were opened and the rain fell on the earth. So all this happened in the middle of this second millennium. Okay. Yah separated the waters above from the waters below. In creation, there was only water and then dry land appeared. In the second 1,000 year day, we have the event of Noah and the ark. The earth was flooded, completely covered by water and dry land eventually appeared. The waters that covered the earth were separated into the waters above and the waters below. Right in the middle of the second millennial day, the water came back together to cover the earth. The canopy of heaven collapsed and bombarded the earth and the water arose from the depth. Noah and the flood was the fulfillment of day two of creation. The second day is the only day that Yahweh did not declare good. It was not a good time. And remember that Yeshua said, as in the days of Noah, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. So we're living in a time very much like that. And as I just said <clears throat> earlier, Peter revealed this. Um, if we go back to um, 
the creation prophecy relating it back to Noah, where it says there was only water and then dry land appeared in the second 1000 years of man. We have the event of Noah and the ark. The earth was flooded, completely covered by water. Dry land appeared. <clears throat> the waters that covered the earth were separated into the waters above and the waters below the earth. And then at 1656 years from creation, in the midst of the second millennial day, these waters broke forth, forth and came back to cover the earth. The canopy of heaven collapsed and Noah and the flood was the fulfillment. Let, this, let there be a sky in the midst of the waters. That's Genesis 1, 6. And then Genesis 7, 11, and the floodgates of the sky were open and rain fell upon the earth. Okay. Creation day three, guess what? <laughs> Creation day three, it says, let the waters be gathered together and let the dry land appear. Does anybody know what happened on day three? Do you remember when they walked through the Red Sea? Let the waters be gathered together on either side and let the dry land appear. They walked through, the children of Israel walked through the Red Sea. It was 3,000 in the, th the third millennial uh, time period when all this happened. Exodus 14 tells us about it. With the blast of thy nostrils, the waters were gathered together. And then it says, and Yahweh caused the sea to go back by a strong wind and made the sea dry land. So we see this is when they walked through to the other side, um, headed to the promised land. There's more that happened on that day, though. There's a lot more. What are the prophetic words from the scripture revealing what would happen in the third millennium from the creation? Here's another one. And Yahweh said, let the water under the sky be gathered to one place and let dry land appear. Somebody's coming in. Okay. Yeah. Let me admit her. Let dry land appear. <clears throat> and it was so. And Yah called the dry land ground, uh, dry ground land and gathered waters as he called the seas. And he saw that it was good. And Yah said, let the land produce vegetation, seed bearing plants and trees on the land that bear fruit with seed in it, <clears throat> according to their various kinds. And it was so. The land produced vegetation, plants bearing seed according to their kinds, and trees bearing fruit with seed in it according to their kinds. And Yah saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning the third day. So what do we see here? We see vegetation seed bearing plants and trees <clears throat> with fruit with seed bearing after their own kind okay the waters were divided and we already talked about this one they were gathered together and they went through the sea on dry ground this was the exodus event massive uh the the fulfillment of the third millennium Part of it was the Red Sea crossing, but like I said, there's more. Somebody. There is more. Wait a minute. Somebody else just wanted in. I hope I got them in. Okay. Yeah, then Yah said, let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed and fruit, <clears throat> trees bearing fruit after their kind with seed in them on the earth. And it was so. Okay. Who did Yahweh talk about the seed to? Okay. What happened in the third day of man, <clears throat> as it metaphorically relates to the land and the seed, the dry land and the seed? What do you think of when you think of the land, multiplication of the seed and faith? Abraham, he says, and in your offspring or seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. Genesis 26, 4, I will multiply your offspring or your seed as the stars of heaven, and I will give to your offspring all these lands there's the land connection, the dry land that comes up. And in your offspring seed, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. The land, there's the land connection again that I gave to Abraham and Isaac. Will I give to you and I will give the land to your offspring or your seed after you. Abraham's seed and the promised land was the fulfillment of day three of creation. It was the promise of the land and the multiplication of the seed of faith of Abraham. This all happened 3,000 years from creation. There you go. Um, in your offspring or seed shall all the nations of the earth. These, these are the verses I just, just read to you. So Abraham's seed and the promised land was the fulfillment of day three of creation along with the Exodus event. 
And day three, also there's more. We need to see dry land and food because remember it says all the food appeared. Dry land appears out of the waters. Israel is brought out of Egypt's populated area. They go through the waters of the Gulf of Aqaba into the uninhabited dry desert, now Saudi Arabia. Vegetation is food for the creatures of the fifth and sixth days. And in the wilderness, both spiritual food as well as physical food, manna came down, if you remember. And what else? What is the spiritual food that was given? The Torah was given on Mount Sinai during this day, this 3,000 years of the span of creation. The Torah on Mount Sinai was given to sustain us spiritually and show us the principles of life through the following millennium. Torah is the seed after his kind, and it's a reflection of his character. Okay, so day, day three is about the dry land and vegetation for food. In the third millennium, we see the Israelites crossing the sea on dry land and living in the desert. But by the end of the day, they have arrived <clears throat> into the promised land flowing with milk and honey. So we see all of this. There you go. The very end, the very end of the third day is when David came along and he was also given a promise regarding seed. Yeah. And we're going to talk about him. He was actually in the uh, the beginning of the fourth day is what I was told. Um, but we're going to talk about him when we get to the fourth day. Um, although I don't think he was the one. Uh, and I'll, I'll explain that when we get to it. Yeah. Um, two kinds of food on the third day. Man is the physical food. The Torah is the spiritual food. Yeshua said he was the manna. And he says he's also the living Torah who became flesh. Again, Torah is the seed after Yah's kind and studying it reveals his character. Okay, now day four. And this is what Stephen was alluding to <clears throat> when we talk about King David, he is next. And Yah said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from night and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. And let them, and this is for our Moedim, our feast days. And let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And Yah made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. <clears throat> he made the stars also. Yah sent them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth and to rule over the day and over the night, to divide the light from the darkness. And he saw that it was good in the evening and the morning were the fourth day. <clears throat> All right. What's fascinating on this? What's the hidden prophecy of the fourth day? It's hidden in verse 16. And Yah made two great lights, the greater light to govern the day and the lesser light to govern the night. He also made the stars. Well, some that I read in this were saying that David would have been the lesser light because when Yeshua comes, he's the greater light who rules from the throne of David. <clears throat> However, there's, I think, a better understanding of the greater and the lesser light. And it's in the Brit Hadashah. We're going to look at that. Um, and this is John the Immerser, who was sent to bear witness to the greater light and the true light of Yahushua. So here we go. God made two great lights, the greater light and the lesser light. David was born at the beginning of the, of the year of the 4,000th um, year or the fourth day of creation. And Yahushua was born um at the end of the 4,000 years, almost a thousand years later, and he goes into the fifth day. So who is the lesser light? Let's look at these verses. John 1 tells us, John was sent to bear witness to that light. That would be the, the greater light. He, Yeshua is the greater light. And John says, he, or John, the, John the Immerser says, he must be greater and I must become less. John was a burning and a shining light but I have a greater witness than John's. <clears throat> so John was the lesser light that pointed to the greater light. Okay, here's day four. He made the sun and the moon to be signs for the sacred times and seasons and for days and years. Okay, the stars. Israel was prophesied to be as numerous as the stars in heaven. John the Baptist was the Lesser light represented by the moon, and Yeshua is the greater light represented by the sun. Yeshua is born 4,000 years from creation. Yah put such apt order to his creation, showing what would come. 
Yeshua comes at the end of the fourth millennial day. And guess what? The stars show the sign of his coming. <clears throat> so there you go. And there's your, your feast days that we're looking at. His holy days called his feast days determined by the sun, moon, and stars prophetically foretell both comings of the Messiah. Yahushua fulfills them exactly in order and on time. And these timings can only be understood by studying and keeping these feasts. The seven feasts of Yah. And we just finished the last one. So the next one will be Passover. So remember the fourth word of the Bible. The Aleph Tav. There you go. He showed up 4,000 years from creation. And there we've just read this already, so I'm not going to read it again. But blessed are those who do the commandments that they may have the right, that they may enter through the gates of the city. Wow. <clears throat> and another verse that supports this, after two days, he will revive us. And in the third day, he will raise us up and we will live in his sight. What's he talking about? Two days from the coming of the Mashiach. Two days later, he will revive us. And on the third day, he will raise us up. We're getting ready to go into the third day from the time that he <laughs> was crucified. So that's what Hosea is telling us. Day five, Yah said, let the waters teem with swarms of living creatures. Let the birds fly above the earth and an open expanse of the heavens. Well, here you go. If you look at <clears throat> these se seven days of creation, Yahusha was crucified at the beginning of day of uh, five um if we're looking at a, a day with yahs as a thousand years he was crucified at that point and in the cre day five and six in the creation story were the only two days that he created life during the seven day days of creation we see here that he created the birds and the fish on day five and then he created man and and beast on day six so here we go <clears throat> Let the water swarm with swarms of living creatures. Let birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the heavens. So Yah created the sea creatures and every living creature that moves with which the water swarm according to their kinds and every winged bird according to its kind. And Yah saw that it was good. And Yah blessed them saying, be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters and the seas. Let the birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening and morning the fifth day. So the waters bring forth abundantly and the moving creature that hath life. Hmm. If we go to the fulfillment of this, he that believes shall receive the Holy Ghost out of his belly flows rivers of living water. So what did he give? The Holy Spirit, the Ruach HaKodesh, <clears throat> that they might have life more abundantly and that the gospel would be preached to every creature. So day five is prophetically fulfilled because of this. And Yeshua said all this at the last day of the feast. This was on the eighth day of the feast. He stood and in a loud voice said, let everyone, anyone who is thirsty, come to me and drink. For whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow out within them. By this, he meant the spirit whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up to that time, the spirit had not been given since he had not been yet glorified. So the Holy Spirit, the water gave abundant life to us, the creature. We're the creature in the fifth millennium. Wow. And we also know in day five that the fish and the birds are created with an assignment to multiply. In the New Testament, men are equated with fish. Remember, Yeshua said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And the Holy Spirit is represented as a bird or a dove. So John said, I saw the spirit descend from heaven like a dove and it remained on him. So Yeshua re 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 arrives at the end of the fourth day. He was anointed <clears throat> at the beginning of the fifth millennium when the Holy Spirit came upon him like a dove. Just as the waters were populated by fish, the population of man grew with the fishers of men during this time. Okay, creatures are created. The Messiah came and died in the symbolic fifth day to make us new creatures. And we are a new creation in Christ when we are grafted into Israel, the olive tree, Gentiles being grafted in and enter into the new covenant experience of having his law or Torah written on our heart. The fish was an early symbol of his followers as he told his disciples 
that he would make them fishers of men. The Holy Spirit fell in abundance upon them and the gospel was fruitful and multiplied in new converts. Day six, Yah said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness and let them rule over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the sky, over the cattle and all the earth, <clears throat> over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And Yahweh created man in his own image and in the image of Yah created he them, male and female, he created them. So what are we looking at? Let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind, cattle and creeping thing, the beast of the earth after his kind, and it was so. And so man was created in the image of God. He was told to be fruitful, to multiply, to replenish the earth, to subdue it, to have dominion over the earth and every beast of the earth. So what happened that would be prophetic? Man was created with the intent of multiplying and filling the earth while at the same time ruling over. He was created at the end of the sixth day in the image of God. Now coming to the end of 6,000 years, it's time for us to be recreated in the image of God, R resurrected. Man was told to be fruitful and multiply. In the last thousand years, mankind has multiplied and filled the earth. There are more people alive today than all of the people in history put together. So that has actually been fulfilled in this millennium. However, <clears throat> God made the beast. God created man in his own image. And he said, let man have dominion over all the earth, including the beast. Mm. But we go to Revelation and we find things are flip-flopped. At the end of the sixth day, they worship the beast. And I believe this is a Nephilim. This is part man, part beast. Power was given him over all kindreds, tongues, and nations. He had power to give life into the image of the beast, count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. So the fifth to the 5,000 to 6,000, the sixth millennium, animals and man, man was created at the 6,000th um, in that time. Each of us now face one last choice at the end of this millennium. Will we be recreated? in the image of Yahweh as a pure bride, or will we take the image of the beast? Pray that we will be recreated in the image of Yah. None of us would take the image because his promise is if we take the image of Yahweh, we will be changed in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, and we will enter into that seventh day of rest. There you go, all seven days, you're, and we're about to come, come in to the time of that rest. And you see that you've got Adam 2,000 years later, Abraham 2,000 years later, Yahusha 2,000 years later, rest. <clears throat> now we're at the seventh day. The seventh day portends, foretells the 7,000th millennium, the 7,000th Shabbat. And so this is what makes Shabbat indisputable. It was never changed to the first day. This was Satan's evil plan to take people out of covenant because this is a sign of the covenant that we're in covenant with him. Y'all blessed the seventh day and made it um, holy. The heavens and the earth were finished and all their vast. On the seventh day, he finished his work, which he made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had made. He blessed the seventh day and he made it holy or set apart. Kadosh. So he created the world in six days. On the seventh day, he rested. He could have created it in four days, 10 years, a billion years, but he chose this pattern. Seven is the number of completion. This, and, and six is the number of man. This seven day week has persisted throughout human day history. It was set up as a template for the Sabbath cycle. Every Sabbath, we are reliving the wedding day. We are rehearsing for the wedding day. We are nearing the end of the sixth day of the millennial cycle and waiting to enter the millennial Shabbat. There's a special blessing in keeping the seventh day Shabbat as commanded to prepare for the seventh day millennium. Adam was created at the end of the sixth day. Believers will be recreated at the end of the sixth millennium at the resurrection of the dead. So the Shabbat was given at creation. It was also written down at Sinai it was kept by his people. It was kept by Yahusha. It was honored by the disciples. It's a sign of his power. It was kept, it will be kept on the new earth. It will not change. <clears throat> With that, 
we are left with the only day of creation that according to Hebrews chapter four, we're still waiting for. And it says Hebrews 4, 8, for if Joshua had given them rest, y'all would have not spoken of another day later on. So then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. This is the one we're looking for. The author of Hebrews also had this in mind when he instructed that the seventh day of the week pictures the millennial rule of our Messiah. This day will occur after Christ's intervention and will last a thousand years. The thousand year reign of our Messiah is future fulfillment of the seventh day of creation or Sabbath, our Sabbath rest. So there you have it, 7,000 year complete plan of Yahweh for man, revealing the end from the beginning. The, from the beginning. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy, Exodus 28. Just as a day equals a thousand years in some prophetic patterns, the Jubilee is a unit of 50 years can be relevant. When Yah says in Genesis 6, 3, my spirit shall not contend with man forever, for he is flesh, his day shall be 120 years. Contend with more means that strive with or, or rival with difficulties or struggle or debate or argue. Yahweh has certainly been contending with us um, far more than 120 years. So if you take this in the lens of Jubilee units, you come to 6,000 years, meaning that there are 6,000 years which Yahweh will strive with or contend with us. But at the end of that 6,000 years, that will end. There are six days of man, and on the seventh day, Yahweh will reign through Yahusha as king on earth for the last day, a thousand years. When the Messiah returns, we will experience the marriage of the Lamb and the millennial Shabbat, a thousand years of rest and peace. May we fall so deeply in love with him that we become his bride without spot, wrinkle, or blemish. Only those who keep his Shabbats will be set aside as his holy people, as this is the sign of those in covenant with him. You shall surely observe my Sabbaths, for this is a sign between me and you throughout your generations that you may know that I am Yahweh who sanctifies you. And then here's another one. Whereas, wherefore the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe Sabbath throughout their generations for a perpetual covenant. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days, Yahweh made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day, he rested and refreshed. Anyone who keeps his Sabbath has an everlasting name and will be with him in his holy mountain. And then this is where it says Isaiah 2 and also Micah 4. It says um, the same thing. Now it will come about to pass in the latter days that the mountain of Yahweh's house shall be established on the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills. All nations shall flow to it. Many people shall come and say, come, let us go to the mountain of Yahweh, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways and we shall walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the Torah and the word of Yahweh from Jerusalem. And he shall judge between the nations and rebuke many people. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation. Neither shall they learn of war anymore. Shabbat Shalom to all of Yahweh's creation. And it shall come about from one new moon to new moon and from Sabbath to Sabbath shall all flesh come to worship before me, declares Yahweh. Isaiah 66, this has not happened. This is going to happen. And then this is a promise to the foreigners and also the sons of the foreigners who join themselves to Yahweh to serve him and to love the name of Yahweh, to be his servants. Everyone who keeps from defiling the Sabbath and holds fast my covenant, even them I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar, for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations. So, last slide, the Prince of Peace will return and rule the earth during the final millennium of rest and peaceful war, teaching the principles of peace from the city of peace, Jerusalem.